Welcome, welcome. We'll get started in a minute or two. Welcome, welcome. We'll give it another minute and we will get started. Welcome, welcome everyone. We're just giving it one more minute to see if we have any more participants logging in and we will get started. Hello everyone and welcome from the California Homeless Education Technical Assistance Center. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. My name is Alejandra Chamberlain, and I'm one of the three leads for the Homeless Technical Assistance Center, also known as the HETAC. As you can see on the slide, the other two leads are LA County Office of Ed and San Diego County Office of Ed. Today, we are presenting Supporting Young Children Experiencing Homelessness, and we have with us today, Erin Patterson, Director of Education Initiatives with Schoolhouse Connection, Denise Clark with the Contra Costa County Office of Education, Charlotte Peterson with the Nevada County Superintendents of Schools, and some housekeeping or web webinar logistics. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted about one week after uh, today on our website, heatech.org. A copy of the presentation and the slides, the resources as well, will be sent to the attendees. And all attendees are muted, um, but we welcome you to ask questions using the Q&A. And there are also the ability to turn on um, captions, so if you want to go ahead and do that. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and present um, and allow Erin to present herself. Uh, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to the HETAC for having Schoolhouse and for um, uh, dedicating some time and attention to the topic of younger children experiencing homelessness. I am Erin Patterson. I'm Director of Education and Initiatives at Schoolhouse Connection. And on the next slide, you'll see a little bit about our organization. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we're a national nonprofit organization, and we are committed to overcoming homelessness through education. And we are very intentional about that mission. Um, I know I don't have to, to convince you all of that mission, but we do know that um, research shows the more education a person is able to attain, the less likely they are to experience or continue experiencing homelessness. And we also know that our schools and early childhood programs are the first and sometimes the only place where a child and their family are seen and identified as experiencing homelessness and connected to really critical wraparound supports. And so that's why we do what we do. You can visit our website, schoolhouseconnection.org. We have lots of resources that we try and make um, available to you all. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter. We only send out an e-news about once a week, if that, so we won't bombard your inboxes. Um, but we do work across all levels on federal policy advocacy, state advocacy, we answer questions from liaisons and early childhood providers and institutions of higher education. And I always say the jewel in our crown is our network of young scholars who we support um, with financial assistance to continue their post-secondary education. Um, and those are young people who have experienced homelessness. 
And so on the next slide, we're going to get into the overview for today's topic. Um, and our next slide sort of uh, just resets and level sets. I know you all know this and could probably recite it backwards and forwards, but we just want to make sure um, that we're defining from the start when we talk about young children experiencing homelessness, um, our early childhood programs uh, do incorporate the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness. And so that's important to know if you work in a K-12 school district or system. Um, when you're thinking about making referrals for younger siblings, um, you can refer them to a program who will prioritize their enrollment and who uses the same definition of homelessness as you're using in your school district. And so that includes those living in cars, parks, or abandoned buildings, um, families living in emergency or transitional shelters, which includes domestic violence shelters, um, which is important when we're talking about young children. Could include families living in motels, hotels, or trailer parks. And then, of course, um, our largest category of students and children experiencing homelessness are those who are sharing the housing of others or our doubled up um, population. And so on the next slide, um, I want to put a point of emphasis on this doubled up situation. Um, we often hear uh, families with young children in particular who tell us they seek out um, doubled up situations when possible because there, there's a lot of fear associated with going to a shelter. Um, a lot of communities, particularly our more rural communities, don't have shelter availability, and so there isn't that option for families. Um, but this doubled up situation can, can often put um, families with young children in a more vulnerable situation. Sometimes it looks like um, a, a young mother staying with an abusive partner because she has no other alternative. Um, it can put families and young children at risk of human trafficking, and it can cause a lot of um, psychological and emotional trauma as well. We hear story after story um, of families with young children who are experiencing homelessness and who say, for example, one mother told us, I didn't want to stay in the shelter because I didn't want my baby's first steps to be on a shelter floor. Or another young mother living in a doubled up situation who shared um, she felt like she always had to shush her toddler because she didn't want the homeowner to get upset and kick them out. And when we think about our young children, those birth to six, or especially those infants and toddlers aged birth to three, those are the most critical and formative years. And environment plays a huge role in how their brains develop, how their personalities come to life. And so I really wanted to emphasize why it's important um, to pay attention to that doubled up situation and its impacts on young children in particular in those developmental stages. Um, if we move to the next slide, I also want to uh, just remind us of this overlap with our unaccompanied youth. Um, uh, unaccompanied youth, as you know, includes um, if a parent forces a young person out of the home due to conflict. And unfortunately, we do see more and more instances of um, parents forcing uh, their, their older youth out of the home because the, the teen has become or gotten someone pregnant. And so now you have a situation where you not only have an older unaccompanied young person, but now it's a two generational issue. And it's so critical to make sure not only that young person can continue their education, but that they're connected to supports for their young child. And in a few slides, I'll, I'll talk about how that can even start in the prenatal stage. Um, and on the next slide, um, I want to sort of set the tone. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit to, to more of the impacts of homelessness on young children and how high quality early childhood programs can mitigate that and can help change the trajectory. But while I go through those slides, I want you to have these numbers in your, in your head. In California, um, of children who are aged birth to six, there are a little over 261,000 birth to six-year-olds who are experiencing homelessness in California. So that's over quarter of a million of your birth to six population are children who are experiencing homelessness. So I want you to have that number in your heads as we go through. Um, and you can see Schoolhouse Connection um, conducted an analysis of data across 20 states, including California. And so we have a lot of different kinds of numbers and data that tells us about the picture of the problem in terms of children experiencing homelessness. Um, you can see that uh, of those quarter of a million children um, experiencing homelessness, a little over 7% are enrolled in a Head Start or Early Head Start program. That is above the national average. Um, the national average after COVID dipped from 10% enrollment to 4% enrollment. 
um, which we unfortunately anticipated because of all the challenges associated with the pandemic. Um, uh, a little over 2,700 of these children experiencing homelessness are enrolled in early Head Start, and that's going to be your birth to three-year-old population. Fewer, 424 total, are enrolled in a licensed child care program across the whole state of California. And then you do have a good um, portion, 492 children who are enrolled in home visiting. Um, and this data point was taken from parents as teachers, but there are a lot of other different home visiting models that you have in your state as well. And we'll get into the different types of early childhood programs that might be available in your community in a few slides. So our takeaway here, all these numbers and percentages and data, the takeaway though is that there are about 91% of children aged birth to six experiencing homelessness in California who are not enrolled in an early learning program. And I want to share a, a little bit of a personal anecdote about why early childhood is so important to me. Um, I started my career many, many years ago teaching um, high school in North Carolina. And my high school was one of the lowest performing in the state. We always had consistently low graduation rates. And um, we had the benefit of being next to a research university. And one year that university did a study and um, they surveyed our, our student body, our ninth through 12th graders. And they asked them, how many of you were read to as a young child? And only 3%. Only 3% of our students reported being read to as a child. And when you put that next to our graduation rates year after year, the correlation was undeniable. And so this, that's, that's when my eyes were open to the importance of early learning um, and how we're often trying to win a whole football game in the fourth quarter. Um, and th these connections to early learning are so critical. So on the next slide, I want to share, um, uh, like I said, uh, there are a lot of different types of early learning programs. When we say early childhood, when we say early, le early learning, one of the questions I get most often from those who work in the K-12 world is, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, and this could look like a lot of different things. Um, and there are a lot of different kinds of age eligibilities. So I wanted to take a moment and sort of level set on that. Um, one program um, is called Home Visiting for Short. The, the federal statute that gives it funding is the Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, or MCV for short. Um, and that program can serve pregnant and expecting parents, as well as caregivers of children who are under age five. And so this is important to know um, because this is one of two programs that explicitly say they will serve expectant parents. So even if you are enrolling a first grader and um, the, the parents have another child on the way, you don't have to wait until that child is born to enroll the parent in the program. The purpose of home visiting is to, um, it's actually the parent who is the student. The purpose of home visiting programs are to provide parents with the skills and knowledge they need to, to uh, provide a safe, developmentally appropriate environment. Um, one of the um, strange um, positives that came out of the pandemic is that many home visiting programs went to a virtual option. And this actually made it easier for families experiencing homelessness to participate and to benefit from those services and supports. Um, McV on the federal level was recently reauthorized and it does include additional funding for those virtual home visits. Um, and you'll often see a lot of home visitors who um, even the name can be off-putting to families experiencing homelessness, um, home visiting, but a lot of programs offer to meet families out in a public place, a, a library, a Starbucks, a McDonald's, um, or some communities have a central meeting location or facility that they can use. So you don't have to have your own home to benefit from these services. And I think that's important to communicate to families who might be put off by that. Your early intervention program um, will serve children with um, diagnosed developmental delays. We have very limited data on the overlaps with children experiencing homelessness, but we do know um, that among our, our older K-12 students, um, students with disabilities are more likely to experience homelessness. So it's important to be in contact with your local early intervention program or coordinator. Then you have early Head Start and Head Start. And these are what we call the gold standard in early childhood. Um, they have a lot of research-based um, benefits, a lot of um, good, strong programming. 
Head Start was um, has adopted, like I said, the definition of McKinney Vento and incorporated it into their performance standards. So every Head Start provider um, gets training on how to make determinations of, about homelessness, um, and it's a checklist that looks very much like your enrollment forms and questionnaires in terms of communicating to families about what homelessness looks like and and what they would qualify for. Head Start and early Head Start programs can also reserve up to 3% of their slots for children experiencing homelessness. And so that's really important. Um, I think important to communicate to families who might have tried to get into another program, like a childcare program, but were waitlisted or told um, it was too expensive, they didn't qualify for subsidy. Head Start and early Head Start um, can reserve those slots and, um, and might be more likely to be able to take families. And then you have your child care providers, um, and uh, I encourage everyone to, if you are referring to child care, make sure it's a licensed child care provider, and then it does fall within your state's quality rating improvement system, or QRIS. Every state has a different determination. Some states have letter grades, some states have one star, three star, five star. So I, I encourage you to look into what your local child care providers are rated. Um, we want to make sure that not only are children experiencing homelessness connected to early learning, but that it is high quality early learning, that it's been validated, that these are developmentally appropriate standards that are being used, and it's a safe environment. So on our next slide. Um, just a little bit more about um, the likelihood of experiencing homelessness as a, a young child um, and its impacts. Um, we know that uh, about 1.3 million babies, toddlers, and young children across the U.S. experienced homelessness in the 2018 to 19 school year. And then this point um, at the bottom of the slide, again, is important to emphasize, 44% of young women ages 18 to 25 who were experiencing homelessness were also current or expectant parents to over 1.1 million young children. So again, that overlap between our older youth population and our young children experiencing homelessness. And then I wanna particularly call out, this includes 18% of young men who are experiencing homelessness, our current or expectant parents to 1.1 million children. Um, we often leave our, our young fathers out of these conversations. And I wanna always make a point to emphasize that, that um, it's, it might be a little easier to identify and spot a young woman who is experiencing homelessness and has a child, um, but our fathers are important to include in these services as well. On the next slide, um, you'll see a little bit about uh, what we know about how this impacts different racial and ethnic groups. Um, first, about 15.4% of infants and toddlers live in crowded housing. And so like we mentioned earlier, um, that's, that's going to be things like trying to shush a child during the period of development when they should be exploring and babbling and, and communicating. Um, and then we also know that Hispanic, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Black babies have a higher incidence of living in crowded housing. Um, and low-income babies are nearly three times more likely to live in crowded housing. So again, the impacts that we see here um, are consistent with what we see among our K-12 students experiencing homelessness in terms of the disproportionality. Um, on the next slide, just a little bit more about these impacts. Um, homelessness in infancy has been found to be associated, like we mentioned earlier, with those developmental delays, delays in language, delays in literacy, social emotional development, and that puts children at risk for later academic problems. Um, we know that the younger and longer a child experiences homelessness, um, the greater the cumulative toll of negative health outcomes. And then the impacts are lasting. Um, we see new emerging research that tells us that even after a family is permanently housed, the child may demonstrate the impacts of that homeless experience for six months to two years after they have been in a, a permanent home. Um, and this can show up in a lot of different ways. This might be your um, young child, your first grader or second grader, who um, all of a sudden de demonstrates behavioral issues when it's time to pack up and go home because they're used to not knowing where they're gonna go or they're used to um, feeling like they're in an unsafe environment. And so it's important for educators in particular to be aware of these consequences. On our next slide, um, you're gonna see sort of the point that I alluded to earlier. When we look later into a, a young person's academic life, um, the high school graduation rate we know for our students experiencing homelessness is the lowest of all 
groups that we um, have data for um, when we break it down by race, ethnicity, low income, students with disabilities, English learners. It's our students experiencing homelessness who always have the lowest rate at about 68% nationally. High school students who experience homelessness are about 10 times more likely to become pregnant or get someone pregnant. So there again, there's the overlap with our older youth who are expecting or parenting and now our generation of younger children who are experiencing homelessness. And actually the inverse is also true. Um, uh, young people who become or get someone pregnant in high school are then 10 times more likely to experience homelessness for the reasons we talked about earlier with um, maybe a parent kicks you out, maybe you, you get afraid and you run away, um, but the impacts are significant. And there again, just emphasizing the developmental delays, social emotional challenges, and long-term trauma. So on our next slide then, because of all of these consequences, it's so important to make sure families with young children who experience homelessness have access to early learning programs, high quality early learning but they often experience more barriers to accessing these programs. So before we go into what can be done, I wanna make sure we're clear about the barriers that families experience so that you can start thinking about how to maybe ease some of those barriers in your communities and districts. The first barrier is just the high mobility of families. Um, we mentioned they could be doubling up, they could be um, staying in different motels where there's availability, where they can afford. And so, um, there's often this uh, perception that if you move out of a service area, you can no longer attend the program. Um, and in a little bit, I'll talk about how some provisions of McKinney-Vento with re regard to school of origin do translate into the preschool space as well. One big barrier um, for families experiencing homelessness is lack of documentation. I know you see this on the K-12 side. It's true as well for early childhood programs. Um, if you try to enroll a child in a child care program, Head Start, home visiting, um, there's certain documentation that's required. You have to show proof of immunization. Um, some, some programs require proof that the family is working a certain number of hours a week. Um, so there's a lack of documentation that can um, deter families from even trying to apply for those programs, but they also don't know that they may be eligible for waivers or for special um, services that allow them access to those programs because they are experiencing homelessness. Lack of transportation, I call this the T word, and I'm sorry I don't have a good solution for it. I know we're all struggling with it right now across the country for all students in our K-12 systems, and then particularly for our younger children, um, where there, there is no public um, school bus system for our early childhood programs. And you get into a whole host of additional um, legal difficulties that make it impossible for a program to transport infants and toddlers who require car seats, et cetera. Um, so, and if a family does not have their own means of transportation, this can pr really um, uh, prevent them from even trying to enroll their child. We also see um, a lack of awareness, both among early childcare providers of the definition of homelessness um, and uh, about the best way to reach families. And then, so I, like I said, I get asked a lot of questions from K-12 liaisons about what early childhood means. What are the different programs in my area? How can I make those referrals? Um, and so that is what we're trying to do through sessions like this is build that awareness. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about some best practices on the next two slides there in the next one. Um, uh, so there's a couple buckets we can think about when you think about, okay, this is a lot. These are some significant consequences. These are some significant barriers. What do we do about it? So I want to sort of, again, level set us. Um, uh, I think most of you are K-12 liaisons, K-12 county um, district um, educators. And so in that role in particular, there are some important linkages that you can make. Um, and the first bucket that we want to talk about is data or data. I use, I use both interchangeably for singular and plural. So forgive me, you can choose which one. Um, so you want to ask yourself a few questions um, in your role, in your position. What data do you already have available? And that could be you have your identification numbers for your K-12 students experiencing homelessness. Maybe 3% uh, of your district student body have been identified as experiencing homelessness. So then we can also assume that about 3% of our birth to six-year-olds in our community are also experiencing homelessness. Um, then you can ask yourself what data would be useful but is missing. 
Um, it could be that as a K-12 liaison, you don't have data on how many children experiencing homelessness your Head Start partners are serving. And so you might be curious to have that. Um, maybe you just want information about what programs are available in your community. Um, and that would be helpful to start. And then you want to ask yourself, who might be able to provide additional data? Um, it, there could be someone within your district that you just haven't had a chance to speak to. Could be one of your local child care providers and you want to set up a, a call or a time with them. But you want to ask yourself, um, what's missing and how can I access this information to get a better picture of the need in my area? Um, the next bucket that I know you all are very familiar with is identification. And then there's the referral piece of that. So you want to ask yourself, how are young children aged birth to five or birth to six currently identified as experiencing homelessness? Um, I strongly encourage you to start with your local Head Start programs if you have Head Start grantees in your community. Like I said, because they do have that determination um, performance standard, they are better versed in um, making those determinations and identifications. You should also reach out to your um, local child care providers, your local home visiting um, programs. Um, you want to you want to understand how those young children are currently being identified as experiencing homelessness. Um, and then once identified, how are they referred to an early learning program? And so this is especially where you all come in on the K-12 side. Um, we often promote at Schoolhouse how valuable K-12 liaisons are to the early childhood world when trying to serve young children experiencing homelessness, because you are the most likely to identify a family. And that means you are the most likely to see that younger sibling who's not yet school age. And it can happen in the blink of an eye. It can be mom, and you know, you're talking with mom in a determination meeting and she says, oh, what time is it? I have to go pick up my two-year-old. I left them with grandma. And so in that moment, what we hope is that a light bulb goes off for our liaisons and they say, I need to ask if that two-year-old is in a program and if it would be okay if I shared their information with our local provider. Um, and so you all are, are a huge link um, to these early childhood referrals and to making sure we can increase that enrollment for younger children. Um, you also want to know about the access and supports um, that are available to, to younger children and families with young children experiencing homelessness. Um, and this is where that um, table comes in that I shared a few slides earlier. You could do sort of a, um, a, a local directory of your early childhood programs. Head Start has a Head Start locator tool where you can type in a street address and it'll show you the closest Head Start or early Head Start program near you. You can go through your local child care resource and referral or CCRNR agencies to make sure um, that you are seeing the, the full universe of programs available in your community, um, because that information is important to share with families with young children. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we want to think about parent empowerment, parent leadership, and parent voice. The best way to understand what obstacles families face when they're trying to access early learning programs is to ask them and to make sure you are providing opportunities for them to share their challenges and also share what's worked. We hear just as much from um, families who have said, you know what made a difference is the way that this person in this program reached out to me. Um, we hear that as much as we do families who say, no one told me that I qualified as homeless and was eligible for these services. So it's important to um, speak with those parents, um, learn what barriers they face, what their needs are, but also what has worked for them in the past. I am going to um, pause here and I look forward to hearing your questions and discussion, but I think I'm going to hand it back off to, I don't know if I'm handing it to Charlotte or Denise or someone else for this next portion. Thanks, Sarah, and I'll go ahead and jump in here. And um, we are hoping to have a few minutes for to take your questions at the end. So we are watching the Q&A, and if we have time at the very end, we'll go ahead and address those. Um, just to reiterate and just touch on some of the things that Erin mentioned earlier, we see that the data clearly shows that the need is far outweighs um, the amount of students getting or early childhood students getting connected to services. And so all the more reason to have um, sessions like this and to kind of cross-reference the TK-12 system with the early childhood folks. And we'll give you some ideas on how we're going about that in just a few minutes in Contra Costa County. 
Um, I did want to acknowledge that we have a variety of folks on the call. We primarily are TK-12 educators or liaisons, but on occasion we do get other folks from um, social services, some community-based organizations, et cetera. And so I did just want to pop in a few slides here just to reiterate about McKinney-Vento Act, um, originally passed in 1987, reauthorized in 2015. And with that reauthorization, um, the preschool um, terminology was added. And so there has been more of a focus on preschool and the inclusion of those services and resources and referrals um, since that reauthorization. It also added some additional liaison duties, so those year district and school site liaisons around identification for preschool age children and access to early education programs. Um, lastly, during the ESSA reauthorization, School of Origin now also includes preschool, um, which I believe Erin also touched on. So just to re reiterate that to folks on the call, if you weren't familiar with that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, early education liaison duties now includes, um, as always, but it's particularly for preschool students, outreach and coordination activities with outside agencies. That's your Head Starts, your early Head Starts and state funded preschool programs. And then again, LEA liaisons must ensure that homeless children have access to Head Start, um, early Head Start programs. And so this comes into a referral piece as well as identification. So just reiterating that those duties were added to the education liaison um, tasks um, with the reauthorization. And then some LEA requirements or district or school site requirements. Um, again, these are universal to McKinney-Vento, your TK-12 system, but also inclusive of preschool is again, designating a local liaison. So if you're a local liaison for your LEA or your district or charter school, um, working with and identifying your zero to five population siblings of your um, students is part of your role. Um, you'll also wanna review your board policy, eliminate barriers to enrollment that's inclusive of preschools if you have LEA operated preschools, um, providing public notice of educational rights. And so those are um, posters from CDE, Department of Education, or a, a localized public notice of education rights for your zero to five and TK to 12 populations. Professional development is a huge one and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit in a few minutes. But again, making sure your homeless liaison and other preschool administrators are um, trained in McKinney-Vento or homeless education um, rights and services. And then again, a huge part of this is always collaboration and coordinating with other service providers. So just wanted to reiterate those requirements that are in the law, Kenny Vento, as well as um, relating to Ed Code and some supportive services in the TK sector. Now I'm gonna go into briefly some of the things we've done in Contra Costa County um, to increase our identification and support of zero to five. Um, just a little background on our county. We're the 11th largest county in California. We have 18 school districts, 23 charter schools. Um, as of last year, we had four districts with state funded preschools um, scattered throughout our county. We have um, locally, we're, I don't know if it's unique or not to our county, but we are Head Start provider. Um, agency in our county is through our actual county entity and it's a community services bureau. It's a division of our county. And they actually serve about 2,100 children ages zero to five through their Head Start programs. And so that's inclusive of, I think we have 13 actual community service bureau Head Start sites. There are 17 partner agencies, um, eight delegate agencies and 14 family child care with Head Start um, slots. And so we do have a pretty robust Head Start and Early Head Start um, entity in our county. And so they are a great partner. And then lastly, um, another area here is we have an average about 500 children ages zero to five accessing homeless services annually. And I'll let you know how I came about that data as we go on in my part of the presentation. It's just kind of an overview for our county. So where to start? Um, obviously, if you're a COE or an LEA liaison, we start with our districts and schools. That's your first point of identification. Um, as Erin mentioned earlier, you might come across a younger sibling or somebody you're meeting with a family that's that you've identified as um, homeless in your district. Um, that's one way to do it. We also are encouraging our districts locally to um, include a section on their homeless questionnaire or their registration forms for younger siblings. So anyone in the household with their ages, that's another way to go about that. And definitely if you're, um, either way you're identifying zero to five siblings, we wanna make sure there's a system in place so that the LEA liaison can get that information and follow up with those families. Cause it's great to identify them, but if we don't actually get them the help that they need and refer them to programs, they aren't going to connect to those services. Um, another way that you can do that is by developing a parent or guardian flyer. Um, Aaron mentioned doing a localized flyer with resources. 
And so that could be something that um, you develop just for your local agency or HETAC, um, Homeless Education Technical Assistance Center just developed a flyer template that is on our website. And so this again is just a very basic flyer, but explains um, for families in transitions, if they have zero to five children, they can actually be eligible for certain kinds of early um, care and development programs. And so this is again, an editable flyer, um, a template if you will, that you can use and adapt for your use at your county or your school or your district. And um, it basically has the information of where they can find out where their local Head Start and Head, Early Head Start programs are, other ECE contacts, and you can adapt this with your own local um, liaison name and contact information. So this is an outreach material. Um, at a very basic level, you could have this at your registrar's office. And again, if you've come across a family with a child, that um, is not in school yet, you can definitely hand out this flyer with the idea that hopefully there will be more follow-up, not just handing a flyer, of course, but giving them the resource and then connecting them to those services. So our next, after you, you know, get your robust system going and your, your LEA funded preschools and you have some systems in place there for identification, your primary partner, of course, is going to be Head Start with Jaron mentioned. This is a really um, mutual beneficial relationship to have because they, um, Head Start programs also have to meet McKinney Bento requirements. And so we have a mutual um, need to partner and we want to identify these students and cross refer. And so I did include on here that the first point, of course, is to identify who your Head Start agencies are in your county. And there is actually a county contact list that has both the county homeless um, TK education liaison and the Head Start agencies. And so that's listed by county for California. And we can provide that um, link to folks on this call as well. But you'll see um, for Alameda, for example, they have several different Head Start agencies, where, as I mentioned, in our county, we have one primary agency that we're able to connect with and then filter the information through. So it's going to vary depending on your county, and some counties um, don't have a Head Start lead either. They might just have a few Head Start spaces, and so it's going to vary by county, but that is, of course, your first partner that you want to reach out to. Um, once you identify who that partner is, um, in our county, we were able to, to identify they actually had a specific um, person that was designated to do um, or to to screen and or assist families who are experiencing homelessness, because again, they, they tend to hold 3% of those spots and they wanna make sure that they're referring family and filling those spaces. And so what we did is we set up a meeting, we met, we discussed what kind of training opportunities that we could cross train um, educators in the TK system, TK-12 system with the Head Start providers. And so we did a couple joint presentations um, we also um, figured out throughout the year, we have them come and attend our, our liaison um, quarterly meetings. And so once a year, we do have Head Start representative come out and she meets with all of our 18 districts and charters who attend these quarterly meetings and reiterates kind of that families are eligible. This is who you would refer them to. And this is the process. And we recommend doing this once a year, at least because as we know, staff changes, um, systems can break down. And so you might have a really robust system of referrals going one year, but something might change, the director might change, um, contacts change. So you do really wanna keep these relationships going and make sure your information is updated every year and you've um, brought these um, collaborative meetings together at least once a year, if not more. We also discussed when we met other opportunities. And so what I did is I went to, out to their parent nights when they had parent meeting nights for Head Start. They also had a parent advisory group. So I would go out and meet with them and do presentations. Um, whenever we had community fairs, um, whether that's on a countywide level or just um, throughout different areas in our, in our county, we would do joint tables together. And so they would kind of present the early ed section and then I'd be right there next to them saying, oh, if you have a student eligible for TK or kindergarten, we wanna make sure you're also aware that they qualify for these educational services if you're living in one of these situations. So just different opportunities to um, cross um, train and collaborate. And then of course, a big part of this is discussing the parameters for sharing information and data collection. Data is huge. Um, and again, they're one of your primary partners because they are um, required, if not highly encouraged to enroll and, and provide outreach for homeless students and youth. And so we really wanna cross share some data and that will let us know places throughout the county that maybe they're not getting very many referrals for or they don't have any students enrolled and how we can kind of um, get more students referred to their programs being that they're eligible and those would be excellent places for them to get those services. 
And so with those meetings, when we met with Head Start, we actually went forward and they developed a homelessness referral form. And so we are one of the entities, um, educators being one of the entities that uses this referral form. And like I said, in our county, since we do have what's called like a centralized person that screens for homelessness eligibility, specifically for all of those centers, um, what we do is we make sure every year our homeless education liaisons get this form. They're aware of what it is for, how to refer families, and they can actually, you would of course meet with the family at your district or um, school site, ask if the child, if they're interested in um, provide them that information first about early childhood programs and Head Start programs. And again, it's gonna depend on their individual situation. And if they're at a place, um, you know, with moving around a lot, if they're, if they're ready to take that um, placement and because you wanna make sure if they're really unstable, it might not be the best time, but we wanna give them that information and lean towards that direction. And so this is our joint referral form. We make sure all of our district liaisons get this every year as long as well as a presentation to be aware of what these services are. And this is our cross referral system that we started. And so um, on our county, we don't have a formalized MOU between Head Start and our LEAs. We haven't um, needed to get to that point yet because we do have such a close working relationship with our county. Um, department, so uh, Employment and Human Services Department that coordinates these services. Other counties might want a definite um, MOU that lays out all of these things as far as cross training, cross referrals, and data collection. And our partners at Schoolhouse Connection have a really good guide, which I put the link on there. And so just those are ideas of things to include in your MOU if you want to go that route with your local Head Start providers. And that might be the way to do it. If you have multiple providers, that might be a good recommendation. Again, we have one centralized, and so we haven't had to go that route here. And then, so once you've worked within your own LEA and you've built up those systems, you've partnered with your Head Start programs, an early Head Start program, we have done some other things in our county just to, again, um, facilitate additional outreach additional areas to connect families and identify them for those services. One of those things, again, we make presentations at parent advisory meetings and or at parent information nights. Um, in my previous role way back when I was a preschool director and so we would have the school district come out and do at that time kindergarten orientation for parents getting ready to transition, now TK for some of our families who are eligible. And we would include that information there and say, hey, if, you know, during the course of when you're getting ready to go to school, or if you're in any of these living situations now, we just want to make you aware that there are educational um, services and there are protections for education. And we want to make sure that you have that information going into the public school system. So that was one opportunity to do that. We've also connected with local planning council for early care and education. Um, that happens, the, the coordinator of that program happens to be here in our, our county office of education office. And so that was a very easy collaboration. Um, I actually used to sit on the planning council and represent homeless and foster youth on that council. And so you can either go right that route where you connect with that person and try to get actually on their board or their planning council and make that a more formal representation for the homeless youth voice. Or you can also, what I did prior to that is just once a year again, make a presentation to them. Say, look, we've only identified X amount of zero to five in our county. We know that there's more students and we wanna make sure families are aware of their services. And so your local planning council is usually comprised of actual childcare providers, um, parents that utilize those services, and then also um, community agencies. And so again, that's just a good cross section to share the information and make sure families and providers are aware of those um, McKinney Vento protections and services. And then if um, going another route, you could also create or participate in a subcommittee or collaborative meeting focused on zero to five. And I know our partners in Nevada County are gonna touch on that a little bit, so I won't go too far on that route, but there's, there's many different variations here. And again, it's just finding the audience, connecting with your community partners and making sure that the information is getting out there. And then another primary partner for every county would be your California Resource and Referral Agency. And so that within every county, they have all of your Head Start, local Head Start, community-based organizations, um, private, um, family-based child care centers. That's like your hub of information of child care providers in the county. And so they are a really great partner. You can partner on informational flyers. They do um, information nights for providers as well as parents. So that's just another avenue to really, once you've worked within your LEA and your Head Starts, this would be kind of your third level of outreach.
And then in addition to that, just a few other areas, um, you know, depending on your capacity, because <laughs> we all know as you're, if you're a homeless education liaison, this all depends on capacity, but these are some tangible things that you can do depending on, um, you know, how much time you have and how many staff you have that can kind of get out into the community and train others. Um, make sure if you can either connect with and or train early intervention staff, regional center staff, um, partner with your local continuum of care. And so in our county, we, again, partner very closely with our county homeless services, which is H3, so health, housing, and homeless services. And through that is there the homeless continuum of care. That is one of our big partners. We partner with them on the point in time count, um, which is the countywide count of all homeless um, individuals every January. And we also, um, Alejandra, who's on this car, call, is our county homeless liaison. She sits on the actual county homeless board. And so we do partner with them very closely. And what we've done this year, um, we've actually done trainings with the continuum of care. And so those are available to all homeless service providers in the county. And that just spreads the net, that widens the net of who's getting this information. And with that, with us training all of those providers, we are actually able to identify numerically about 500, four to 500, um, zero to five students a year early childhood students a year that have access to homeless services in our county. So these are likely um, children and youth who have not touched education systems at all or early education, but that lets us know how wide the gap is of how many children in our county, county are experiencing homelessness versus those who are actually accessing services. And by providing training to all of the service providers that are providing services to all those children, we are definitely hoping that we're increasing that um, avenue to get them to access those services. And so again, where in your LEA, you might only identify 15, 20, 30 students that are in LEA um, run preschools, and then you might identify another 20, 30 in Head Start programs. 500 additional were identified through our um, homeless management information system through our county service providers. And so that again, just looking at your data and where you're collecting that data, that kind of shows you the need and kind of other things that we could do to support that. Um, something else we do in here, here in our county, of course, is host tables at community events, such as uh, National Night Out. We, um, not since COVID, but we used to have a homeless services one-stop event. And so if we had parents who their kids were in school during the day, but they were bringing their two-year-old to these homeless one-stop events, that would be our place along with Head Start to kind of say, hey, come to our table, let us talk to you. And we'd give them some information and make sure they were getting connected to services. Because if they're with mom and dad and, and going to some of these events during the day, they could be in some of these early childhood care programs and getting some services. Um, other ideas that we've done is we make sure our county crisis center has all of our resource materials. We do outreach events with them, job fairs, health fairs, just any time to get that information out to the public is a good, there's, there's not a bad opportunity. It's somebody's gonna take that information and, and whether it's for them or to help a friend, we wanna get that out there. And then shelters, of course. Um, the reason I put shelters a little further on my list is because our, the majority of our shelter programs in our county are, are run through or with the continuum of care. We have what's called um, coordinated entry in our system. And so really, even though we might have several shelter programs and shelter um, uh, ho hotel programs, different programs, they all run through our county's continuum of care for the most part. There's a few outliers, but not too many. And so it's called coordinated entry. They call 211 in our county. They get vetted, um, go through a process, and then get connected to services through that process. And so that's why the majority of um, students or youth um, zero to five that we would identify in shelters will already be accounted for in that large 500 number that I said that we identify through our homeless service provider network. Um, but um, we still want to do that outreach. And so we actually go out physically to the shelters and we trim the case managers every year. Again, high turnover a lot of times at shelters. And so you want to do that at least once a year, preferably twice a year, making sure if you're the homeless liaison, you go out and let them know. If you're the county liaison, you give them the list of all the district liaisons. And so they know who to connect families with there. And then again, making sure that they're aware of who you are and how to get a hold of you if they have questions with um, clients staying in their programs. Um, another thing that I used to do before COVID, not so much now, but we're hoping to do that again, is do um, 
parent information one on one or during parent education nights. Again, it's going to depend on who's in the shelters at that time, your family shelters. Sometimes we do have more younger students zero to five, and then other times not as much. So one on ones tend to be the way that happens, but it just depends again, depending on the turnover or how long families are staying in your family shelters. Another layer, of course, is partnering with your um, public libraries, motels, and resource centers. Definitely, um, again, we partner with our county library system. And so every year we make sure we send out that you can enroll in school posters and get those up at their community boards. Um, it is more TK oriented, but we do also know that they do a lot of preschool activities there. And so we wanna make sure that information is accessible where parents are walking by frequently and they can kind of see that information. Of course, partner with your local first five resource centers, um, crisis centers I mentioned earlier, any community partners that families are gonna be accessing services at, make sure your posters are up, they have your contact information, whether that be the you can enroll in school poster and or a um, early ed version of that. So you could either use the HETAC version we showed earlier or create your own localized version. But again, just making the resources easily av available and accessible for families. Um, and if you do need posters, again, as, as most of you on this call probably know, you can re request the posters here from the CDE website, and those are downloadable as well. And so where are we going with all this? As, as Aaron mentioned earlier, identification is the, the data. I mean, we have to know where to look for the data, who to coordinate with, who to collaborate with. And this is important on many facets, obviously, for the benefit of this, the zero to five students and getting them connected to services, but also it shows the need in your county and where we need services most. Um, this is beneficial for Head Start programs as they're applying for funding, as well as grants that come up. And so all of this, we just wanna make sure we're reaching out to all of our partners and collaborating and coordinating to get accurate data. Um, obviously begins at your district and school sites, getting those questions added to your registration materials or your homeless um, housing questionnaire. So we can kind of screen for younger siblings, um, making sure that your registration staff in your LEA early child, if you have early childhood programs that they're trained in McKinney Vento, again, cross training, making sure they have those flyers available that you could create for your local resources. Um, collaborating with publicly funded preschool programs. Again, those might be at your LEA or might be through your resource and referral agency, collaborating with them and making sure that, again, there's cross-training happening there and that your resources are being shared back and forth for referrals. Um, facilitate a data sharing agreement, or if you're not there yet, connect with your local Head Start and Early Head Start programs. Make sure you guys are aware of each other and you know, you know what openings they have in their programs, where they're geographically located how you can get referrals to those. Um, that is your primary partner as far, as far as your early ed um, students and getting them connected to those services for which they qualify and they need to be enrolled. And then again, coordinate with your local continuum of care. And so that's not necessarily um, just the zero to five population, but they will, they will be able to identify the majority of any family, any with a zero to five student that's accessed any homeless services within your county. Um, again, depending on your county and how robust that system is, that is a good data sharing um, partner because you can kind of get the overall picture of how many students have, youth have been identified, even if they're not quite getting to our early ed systems yet. And with that, I am going to pass it over to my colleague at Nevada County. Oh, I think she's muted. <laughs> All right, I always forget that step. Hi, I'm Charlotte Peterson. I am the Homeless Education Program Specialist for Nevada County Superintendent of Schools. And um, my colleague, Mr. Melissa Perrette, was going to do the presentation today, and unfortunately, she was not able to make it. Um, Melissa is Nevada County's, uh, the county coordinator, the Homeless Education County Coordinator. Um, as I said, I'm the program specialist. And then we have Katie Dyer on our team and she's our case manager. Um, and so Nevada County is um, a rural county serving roughly 11,500 students, um, eight elementary schools, one high school district and six charter schools. Um, we do not have specific Head Start and early Head Start programs. The Nevada County Superintendent of Schools does have a child development center and they have um, Head Start funds. 
for a few spots. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit of information about our county. Um, these are last year's numbers for 2021-22 school year. And we had 265 students identified last year. Uh, and of those, 19 were zero to five. And um, those students last year, the zero to five population, was identified from uh, school sites, from our student residency forms where families indicated that they had um, younger children in the family or students that were children that were attending our child development center. Next slide, please. And um, so this is still for last year breakdown, but this year, I'd like to mention, I'm the data person in our, in our team. Um, so uh, this year, the number here shows that we've identified 216 students. However, as of yesterday, that number was 269 students. And of those 31 uh, children, zero to five, have been identified already this year. And that's just taking baby steps. We're just in the beginning beginning the backup of it. We're just in the very beginning process of working with um, agencies and providers that work with um, the zero to five population. So um, we're pretty excited that just in this past year, that number that we've been able to identify has jumped um, from 19 to 31. Um, but, uh, and last year, mentioned our identification was either through a school district from older siblings that the family had indicated they had a younger child or from our child development center. This year we have um, identified some of that population in the zero to five from our transitional housing um, facility. We have one family shelter here in Nevada County. It is run by the Salvation Army and our case manager and myself and one of the staff from the family uh, transitional housing shelter get together. We try to do this quarterly and she goes through her list of families and the waiting list to see if um, students have been identified. And this is students of any age, but we're capturing um, a larger number of families with young children that may not have any school age children. So this is kind of an exciting little first step to um, be able to get um, some more of the identification process started. Next slide. So um, we have held one um, community uh, conversation on helping to identify children zero to five. We sent out invitations to uh, agencies that work with this population. We partnered with our local first five and um, tried to gather names of organizations that would be interested in coming together and having a conversation about um, what homelessness looks like within families, um, how it affects the children in zero to five population, all these things that, that both um, Aaron and Denise have um, talked about a lot of these um, factors. Um, as I said, we're just in the beginning stages of this. Um, next slide, please. So some of the agencies that we had in attendance are listed here on this um, slide. We um, so Sierra Nevada Children's Services is, is our county's uh, child care resource and referral agency. Um, for this meeting, we did not have preschools and daycare staff uh, in attendance. We did have our child development center uh, participate, but uh, the next step we are going to for our next meeting are going to include some preschools preschool centers, some daycare facilities, and we're gonna work with Sierra Nevada Children's Services to identify um, who they feel would be the best fit to start 
helping us with this planning process in the county. Um, next slide. So just very briefly, we're gonna um, just share with you what we did for our beginning steps in our meeting. So it was very brief. It was a one hour Zoom meeting. Um, we used Menti to introduce, well, we were going to use Menti to introduce ourselves. Uh, that didn't quite work out. So um, we just introduced ourselves um, via Zoom. Then uh, a brief overview of the McKinney-Vento uh, requirements, guidelines uh, were explained to everyone because some folks were not aware of, of McKinney-Vento. Some had heard of it, but really had no idea what um, homelessness, homelessness really means um, in the education field. Um, we also did some jam boards and fishbone diagrams, and I have some slides of those just to kind of give you an idea of some of the things we talked about during our first meeting. Next slide, please. So we had four uh, questions that we wanted to address. So the first was just what services did different agencies provide to families with children ages zero to five? And um, I won't read you know, these answers, but these are, these are the responses that we got from, you know, some from the library and um, uh, a family. We had uh, Sharif Youth Center, which works with um, teens, young adults. And so we have some teen parents in this program that have children zero to five. Um, and the next question we asked, please. So <laughs> we had a little bit of a challenge getting the responses for this one. So the question here was, did um, we, after having talked a bit about what the McKinney-Vento Act was, what homelessness looks like, did the organization feel that, that some of the qualifiers that we had talked about did that fit with families that they had in their program? And their choices were, you know, yes, they did have families. No, they did not feel that they had families that fit and, or they weren't sure. And so the lines um, are answering how many of the organizations felt that they had families that did or did not fit into some of these qualifying categories for McKinney Vento homelessness. Next slide, please. We then asked them um, if they had a question on their intake and registration paperwork, asking about homelessness or housing transition for the families. Um, and these were our responses. Um, so someone was not sure. Uh, the Sharif Youth uh, House said that they did have a questionnaire for their uh, infant toddler program, but no, they did have a questionnaire for their youth that came in, but not for the children in the childcare that was on the facility ground. Okay, next slide. And then we ended with the um, fishbone causes and problems and, and uh, just talked a bit about why families did not come forward or um, maybe they didn't know what were some of the reasons, some of the causes and problems about barriers to identification, because that's really where we were starting was with identification. Um, and then we will move forward as we um, go into our next meeting. Okay, um, next slide. So uh, we did run into, um, a few challenges after our first meeting. So we uh, still have to share out the data with those that participated and that information will go out to them uh, next week. And we are working on including daycares and preschools at our next meeting. We are just uh, getting ready to set the date for our next meeting. There's a, a few folks that we're waiting to hear back from uh, as to their availability. And we are uh, planning on doing a media blast about this effort um, and, and what we're trying to accomplish in the county. So that is 
that's our first steps and that's where we're at in this process. And um, as we move toward so many of the things that um, you mentioned, Denise, as you were talking, it's like, yes, that's all, those are all on our um, kind of to-do list and how we want to move forward with um, working with our um, child care resource and referral agency and other agencies that can help identify uh, and letting providers know that um, we have these families out here that are on their list that they may not be aware of um, that are homeless. Thank you. Like Thank I said, Melissa sure. would have done such a, a much better job at this. <laughs> No, we, thank you, Charlotte. We appreciate you sharing on behalf of Melissa in Nevada County. Um, and I think it's important to to kind of show where where, where to start. Um, as I said, our county we we are a larger county, and so we were fortunate that our Head Start program and our COC or Continuum of Care that those are two county large entities that we partner very closely with. And, and by that means, we were able to quickly. Not even, I wouldn't say quickly. We were more accurate, like just that partnership was kind of there. And so we didn't have to maybe identify um, as much, which is the first part. And so that that did afford us a little more um, time and, and to, to go out to some of those other providers that maybe we wouldn't capacity wise been able to do if you're a smaller um, county or if you're a, a liaison that's only funded. 15% out of well, that's 15% of your role. And so the capacity and, and where to start is really going to vary depending again on your county and your resources. Um, but just um, wanted to make folks aware of all the different partners that you could start looking at within your county to make sure that um, we're, we're moving in the right direction to try to identify more and support our zero to five learners. And so with that, I did want to share, and I, I think I neglected to mention earlier, um, I so I was the local liaison for Contra Costa for many years, and, and now I'm supporting the HETAC, or Homeless Education Technical Assistance Center, work with Alejandra in our county, and we're supporting 24 counties um, nearby. And so this was something um, that we partnered with LA County Office of Ed and San Diego County Office of Education, who are the other two HETAC leads and just provided a resource area um, on the HETAC website. And this is where you'll find that template that I shared earlier of a, a template to share information about early learning programs with your families. So that, that template's available on here. And we're gonna also be populating more information um, again, that'll be helpful as you start to reach out to more providers in your area. Um, you also see we have Schoolhouse Connection tag there on the bottom. They have a lot of good resources on their website that we refer to often. Um, the Head Start, locator is on there as well. So, which I um, did a snapshot of that earlier. So if you're not sure in your county who the Head Start um, contacts would be, that's a good place to start. Um, again, beyond that, always start at your LEA. So if you have any um, district um, operated preschools, that's your first point of contact, making sure your registrars again are trained and that you have some resources and then branch up as you're able to with your capacity. There's always more that can be done as we know. Um, just wanted to share again some other resources. Um, Department of Education on the homeless education page does have a PowerPoint from 2021 that has a lot of the same information there. So you'll see that if it does have a lot of the laws, McKinney-Vento, so that might be a good thing to take with you um, if you're a homeless education liaison and you're partnering with Head Start or another um, community entity and you want to do a presentation. I find sometimes that the Department of Education logo on app training materials is a nice thing to have because you're delivering that message from Department of Education. Um, and I know they worked very hard on that PowerPoint as well. And so um, I want to reference that. Um, National Center for Homeless Education, Preschool and Early Childhood has some great resources. There's a whole guide on there. Again, Schoolhouse Connection, I can't say it enough. We, we use their materials a lot and they have um, a really good resource on there as well. And then I was working in the early childhood department here at our county office last year and did come across the responsive early education for young children and families experiencing homelessness. This is a good resource for our early childhood providers. Um, so again, wanting to direct them to those materials. I know Head Start has a lot of those on their website as well. And so just um, kind of looking at all angles and how we can cross train and be become better aware of McKinney-Vento rights and services that we can mutually refer families for. And I think actually we got through our presentation pretty quickly. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, and I think, do we have some questions in the chat, Alejandra, or did we get any questions? 
There are two questions in the chat. Um, there's actually four questions, two of them were already answered. And there are two more. Um, I don't know if anyone actually knows the answers to these questions, but we could take a stab. They're asking about data regarding children experiencing homelessness and higher and having higher incidence of delays, and particularly they're referencing uh, toilet training and how programs require uh, most um, entry into care to already be toilet trained. And so how do we advocate on behalf of children experiencing homelessness if they have some delays and but need that support? So don't know if anyone has any information for that. I, I noticed I sat there for a little bit acknowledging that um, that might take a little bit of research, but I'll pause to see if anyone wants to take a stab. You know, that one could be tough because that's going to really, your school site might not be able to accommodate that need. Um, and that that is separate from the um, being eligible for a program. And Erin might have it, but I'm just um, referring back to when I was a program director. Um, that, that would be a separate need that I don't know would... Um, super vent the your eligibility, I should say, if you're experiencing homelessness. So that one could be tricky. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. And what I would say is definitely defer to your local programs and whatever their policies are that they have in place. I do know, though, and someone else chimed in here. Thank you for the backup um, that we're, when it comes to Head Start, Head Start is prohibited from um, blocking a child from enrolling just because they're not toilet trained. Um, but then someone also mentioned, but you are required to potty train immediately upon enrollment. And so that would certainly apply to children experiencing homelessness as well. They wouldn't be exempt, um, but that would that's the general standard there. It's a really great question, really speaks to the ripple effect of homelessness. You know, I you think about um, all the time and energy and consistency it takes to do something like potty training, to do something like um, learning how to walk and talk and all of those um, fine motor skills. And so that's why it is so important um, to check with your local programs on the policies they have in place that might help families experiencing homelessness overcome some of those barriers and then the, the added supports that they have built into their program. So that's a really great question. And those were the only two pending questions. I don't know if anyone else has questions that they would like to. Um, they, I believe we have the ability to have you raise your hand and we could unmute you, allow you to talk. So if that's an option. Not seeing anything yet, but we can give it a minute just in case. And I am adding our evaluation form in case your QR code is not working. Feel free to use the link in the chat. Okay. I will take the silence as an indication that there are no questions. Happy Friday, everyone. I hope you have a beautiful day. And thank you again to our presenters for their information that they have provided. And to all those who attended, I hope you found this informative. Have a, a wonderful day. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great weekend. You also.